one heard that he had been spirited out of Denmark uh, by a fisherman in, in a boat going the several kilometers across uh, the Kattegat, I think it's called, to Sweden. Uh, he only remained in Sweden very briefly. Uh, he was intent on getting to Britain, and, and uh, the British were intent on having him. So they sent a mosquito bomber uh, to Stockholm. Uh, there was no place for him except in the bomb bay, and those planes had to fly fairly high uh, and did require oxygen. Uh, so they tried to find uh, an oxygen mask, which was large enough to go around his rather leonine face, uh, they couldn't. <laughs> he, uh, and in fact, he froze and passed out on the flight <laughs> to Britain, and uh, uh, pretty nearly had done him in by the time they got there. Uh, uh, I don't know quite how he came to America, whether it was by boat or plane, uh, uh, and uh, his name as, as an individual, as a presence, was simply never mentioned at Los Alamos. Uh, the, reason, the reason was, of course, that the security people knew that uh, just breathing his name to, to anyone, a, a truck driver or a, a sweeper or whoever, if it were passed on, would tell the whole world what we were doing. So uh, I wasn't there very long. He, he uh, bore only made visits of uh, a couple of weeks at a time to Los Alamos. I don't know what he was doing in the intervals, but then a month or two would pass and he'd be back again. Public address system which was the way in which people uh, got their friends to the telephone in the absence of uh, cell phones and the like, uh, there was a PA system which, which uh, kept up a, a, a steady mention of people's names, summoning them to the telephone. Uh, they were petrified that that name might appear, might, might uh, come over the, the public address system sometime. So he was given the name Nicholas Baker, and that was used uh, wherever he went, in fact. Uh, it was a very improbable name for this man who I, I gather was, was pretty athletic when he was younger, but he was a large, hum hunched figure, uh, rather heavy, uh, and with an absolutely leonine head. Uh, uh, really unmistakable if you knew what the guy looked like. Uh, but uh, when they announced over the, this PA system that there would be a talk given by Nicholas Baker, all of a sudden the offices would empty and there would be <laughs> and, uh, uh, a greater crowd than the room, whatever it was, uh, could support. Uh, he didn't speak very often, and when he did, it was very little to the purposes of the, of the laboratory. He knew very well what was going on, and he commented on it from time to time. We heard these comments. He made occasional suggestions, but there were problems, I'd have to say, when he spoke, uh, because, first of all, he almost always had a pipe in his mouth. Uh, when he was sitting uh, talking to people in, in his office, the tobacco had long since uh, been extinguished, and he would strike matches one after another, inhaling the smoke of the matches. <laughs> he, he, in effect, smoked matches more than tobacco. Uh, he spoke in the softest of voices, Danish, I'd have to tell you, is not a language with crisp, 
uh, consonants or anything of the sort, you would uh, 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 hear a kind of mumble. And uh, unrelieved by his ever opening his mouth <laughs> around, his, around his pipe. So he was really not very much of a public speaker. And it was inevitable, though, that he be asked to give a colloquium. He would be introduced uh, by Oppenheimer, uh, and uh, he would uh, stand up and, and uh, begin this mumbling. I have to tell you that when on the two occasions he did it, there was a pool, a betting pool, among the younger scientists, just how long his talk was going to last. Uh, and uh, uh, he would begin talking and making reference to these diagrams of diffraction experiments and things, uh, mumbling away. You couldn't make out any very distinct sounds, but they had always provided a, uh, a, an amplifier system. He had a microphone someone had hung around his neck, but of course it had a long cord. There was no such thing as, as uh, radio uh, transmission of, uh, from microphones in those days. So uh, he had this long, heavy cord connected to the microphone around his neck. He would very likely turn around facing the blackboard, but then would always turn around in the same direction. So after about three turns, you would hear a loud pop and the connection would be broken. And then you would not hear another sound but the faintest sort of mumbling. <laughs> the pool was won by the, 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 the chap who guessed an hour and a half. Uh, 